Hi everyone, this is Ms. Baker. I wanted to try something different for Module 2 and actually go through and give you some video lecture notes from myself instead of just taking you through presentations that are like PowerPoint slides. So for chapters 4 and 5, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a clear, concise explanation of problems and detailed notes and you can hear me talk as we are going through this explanation. So starting with chapter 4, we are going to take probability to another step. But before we do that, we need to look at the fact that when you did chapter 1, you talked about two different types of data. You had quantitative data and qualitative data. Chapter 4, we're going to focus on types of quantitative data, one specific type. That's also known as nominal data, the quantitative, because it has a quantity. And taking the average actually makes sense. That's why it's quantitative and not qualitative. There is discrete quantitative data. In this case, discrete data is finite in nature. meaning it has a specific finite number of actual values that it can take on and it stops. It can be placed on a number line. The actual values that the um, variable can take on can be placed on a number line. The other type of quantitative data is continuous data. And continuous data, sorry this is going to happen a couple of times because of what I'm using, but continuous data is data on an interval. Without finite number of values. So to give you kind of an example, discrete data in a lot of cases we're talking about the number of something. The number of siblings, the number of pets, the number of AP courses you took in high school. Whereas continuous data is usually measurements. like weight and volume. And the difference is continuous data, when we say it's on an interval, if I have a bottle of water and on the bottle it says 16.9 fluid ounces, that doesn't mean there's exactly 16.9 fluid ounces in that bottle. Because depending on how precise the measuring device is that you're using, will determine how precise your measurement can be. You know, it could be 16.92, it could be 16.89 fluid ounces. Measurements are only as exact as the tool that you're using to measure them. So we do, we talk about continuous data on an interval as opposed to one exact finite value. Well, chapter four is going to focus on discrete random variables. And we're going to look at four different examples of discrete random variables. And their probability distributions. So a discrete random variable, again, can take on a finite number of values. Um, for its probability distribution, you will have x values and you have p of x values. Your x values are your numerical values that represent possible outcomes. And 
and p of x values are the probability of each outcome. So looking at an example, and this kind of is a document, this is a document that I'm going to upload for you onto Moodle um, that kind of goes through and gives you additional examples and definitions of what I'm talking about. So again, this is section 4.1. We're talking about the discrete random variable. And when we talk about this probability distribution, the things that we have to keep in mind is that for all of these different x values, these pair of x values have certain properties. The first property is that p of x, since it is a probability, if you go back and you think about what happened in chapter 3, every probability must be a number between 0 and 1. It cannot be a number greater than 1, it can't be a negative number. And the other thing that's going to make this valid is that if I take the sum of all the probabilities that will be listed beside your p of x, they will have to equal 1 because the x's are all the possible outcomes. And so if you add up the probabilities, you should have the total sample space. And that's what this valid probability distribution is talking about here. Well, when we get into an example of a discrete probability distribution, we can talk about what would happen if I rolled a fair six-sided die. Well, the possible outcomes would be one through six on the die. And if it is a fair die, then each of these outcomes has a probability of one-sixth of happening. If it was a weighted die, that would be a completely different story. And so all of these are between 0 and 1. And if I add up all of these, I get 6 out of 6, which is 1. So that makes it a valid probability distribution. Here's another example. The number of overtime hours is given as the possible x values that could occur and each number of overtime hours has a frequency of employees and so the probability is the frequency divided by the total. Well if we look at the total here we have and let's see let me go ahead and pull up my calculator And this will look like the TI-84 calculator that you guys have, or that you should be using, if I can ever get the calculator to pull up. Let's see, I can probably add these on my own here until my calculator wants to decide to work. So 8, 15, 24, 32. Carry 3, 4, 6, 11, 12, and 7 is 19. So that would be 192. So for my P of X, which is my probability, this would be 6 out of 192. 12 out of 192. And I would encourage you to print this document so that you can, as I'm going through and talking and working these problems, you can write on it as well. 29 out of 192. 57 out of 192. 42 out of 192. Make sure that looks like a 9. 30 out of 192 and 16 out of 192. And all of those should add up to 192 out of 192. And you can divide, go ahead and divide that and write those as decimals if you choose. 
So looking at this first question, does this represent a valid discrete probability distribution? That answer would be yes, because all the probabilities are between 0 and 1. And the sum of all the probabilities is equal to 1. So those are the two things that make it valid. Let me go ahead and try again to get this calculator to pull up. We're definitely going to need to... There we go. So if you have a probability, while the calculator is pulling up, I'll go ahead and talk. If you have <coughs> a probability distribution and you're missing one of these values, just add up what you have and subtract it from 1 and you'll get the missing value because the sum of all of them has to equal 1. When you start answering questions, like number 2, find the probability of working 2 overtime hours. So 2 overtime hours would be 29 out of 192 and if I ever get the calculator to pull up then we will look at what that value is as a decimal but you can leave it as a fraction or a decimal. The probability of working less than two overtime hours would be 0 and 1 added together so that would be 18 out of 192. The probability of working at least five overtime hours. So be careful whether you're at least and you're at most. At least means five or more. So that would be five and six added together, which would be 46 out of 192. The probability of working at most three, at most is going to indicate less than or equal to. At least indicates greater than or equal to. And that's important, especially in the next couple of sections. So at most 3 would be 0, 1, 2, and 3 added together. So that's 18, 18 and 29 is 57, and 57 and 57 is 114. So that would be 114 out of 192. And the probability of working more than five overtime hours would just be six here, so that would be 16 out of 192. There's our calculator. So, like I said, you can change these to decimals instead, and you can do them individually. 0.03125, and so you could have written these answers as decimals instead of fractions, and I'll let you go back and finish that on your own. So looking at the probability of working between 2 and 4 overtime hours, inclusive means you want to include 2 and 4. Now let's talk about this word unusual. Unusual, an unusual event are any events whose probability is less than 0.05. So if you go back and look at some of the answers that we had, zero overtime hours would be an unusual event. Let's see, so 29 
Let's see here. Sorry about this, guys. Gotta love technology. So 29 divided by 192 was 0.15104. That's not unusual. 18 divided by 192. 0.09375, not unusual. So if 18 wasn't, 46 obviously will not be. 114 will not be. 16 divided by 192, 0.08. So again, that's not unusual either. So as you're trying to answer that question, if you have an unusual event, look at each of your probabilities. If any of them are less than 0.05, then yes, it is unusual. So in the problems that you're going to see for your probability distributions in section 4.1, you could be asked to find a missing probability. And remember, to be valid, the sum of the probabilities has got to equal 1. So that's what you would use to find a missing probability. You could be asked to calculate a probability. Which, like I just went through that example, you just look at what x values fall into whatever event is being defined and you add the probabilities relative to the outcomes included in the event or in the defined event. Now the third thing that you could be asked to do is to find the expected value. And the expected value is the same thing as finding the weighted average. And that was talked a little bit about in chapter 2. So when you talk about a weighted average, you're actually, instead of taking your x values, adding them up and dividing by how many there are, you're actually considering the fact that they may not be equally distributed. They may have different probabilities. And so you're going to weight each x value based on its probability and then find its average. And so the way that you're going to do that is you're going to take the sum of each x value times its individual probability. So here's an example. Let's say that the possible x values that I have are 0, 1, 3, and 7. And for my probabilities, let's say this is 0 0.2, this is point 0.4, this is point 0.1, and so that would be 4, 5, 6, 7. This would be 0.3. So each x value is weighted differently. has a different frequency and a different relative frequency. So if I want to find out what's expected to happen in this distribution, or the average x value here, I'm going to take, and we're going to use E of x for expected value, And this says take each x value and multiply it by its probability. So I'm going to take 0 and multiply it by 0 0.2 plus 1 times 0 0.4 plus 
plus 3 times 0 0.1 plus 7 times 0 0.3. And that's 0 0.4 plus 0 0.3 plus, point, plus 2.1. which is 2.8. So you can do it individually and use the formula and you can find your answer. Or you can do this in the calculator. To do it in the calculator, you're going to go to stat plus 4 to clear your lists. and hit enter and you're going to go to stat edit so to clear any lists since you're going to be using this for a lot of different problems do stat the plus button and then four and it'll clear your list and you have to enter and it will say done so then you're going to go into stat edit and you're going to put your x values in list one and you're going to put your p of x values in list two so for this problem, so second plus four, enter. And now when I go into stat edit, I don't have anything in my calculator. So I'm going to put my x values in list one, zero, one, three, and seven. And then I'm going to go over to list two and put my p of x's, so point two, point four. 0.1 and 0.3. Now here's how it, where you have to tell your calculator that you want to find the average but you want to consider the weights of the list or the weights of each value. So you are going to hit stat arrow right over to calc. You're going to choose number one which is one of our stats. Now if you have a newer calculator, and what I did right there was I just hit stat quit to get out of everything. But if you have a newer calculator, when you go over to stat calc one of our stats, it's going to come up with this. What list do you want me to find the average of? Or find all the statistics of? Well, I want that to be list one. If I am not weighting my average, then you don't put anything in frequency list. But considering I want to use the weights here, I'm going to do second L2 because I want it to consider the, the probabilities as my weights. And so when I hit calculate, this X bar is the same as it was here. So to what I did, I did stat, arrow over to calc, chose one of our stats. My list, I need to make sure I have L1. And beside frequency list, I need to put L2. And to get that, I hit second two. it gave me the 2.8 that I did by hand. So that was the third thing you could be asked to do. The fourth thing you could be asked to do is to find the standard deviation. Now from chapter 2, standard deviation by definition is the average distance from the mean. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to take each x value subtract the expected value or the mean, square it so that all of them are positive, all the differences are positive and we don't have um, positives and negatives that cancel each other. Then we're going to weight it and then once we add them all together because we're talking about standard deviation and not variance, we have to take the square root of all that. So that's your actual formula. And if I was going to do it by hand, I would do 
0 minus 2.8 squared times 0.2 plus 1 minus 2.8 quantity squared times 0.4 plus 3 minus 2.8 quantity squared times 0.1 plus 7 minus 2.8 quantity squared times 0.3 so again if I was doing that by hand I would do 0 whoops. 0 minus 2.8 squared times 0.2 plus 1 minus 2.8 quantity squared times Point four plus three minus two point eight squared times point one plus seven minus two point eight quantity squared times point three and I get eight point one six but that is what is under the radical which is variance so when I take the square root of that I get 2.857 now if you look back at what we did a minute ago stat calc one of our stats make sure that that's list one and list two and if you look at the sigma here that's your standard deviation and it's the exact same thing that I just got doing it by hand so that tells you how to do everything that you will be asked to do for section 4.1 Section 4.2 gets into a specific type of discrete random variable which is called a binomial random variable. A binomial random variable, there are five special qualities that make it binomial. So it's discrete, so we know it's finite, we know it's countable, we know that it can fit on a number line. And the important things about it making it binomial versus just some random probability distribution is that it has, first of all, two possible outcomes. We call those success and failure. But it's how it's defined. Like it could be being late or being or not being late, being female or not being female, being married or not being married. So there's two possible outcomes. You either are or you're not, or the unit or your thing is or it is not. There will be an N number of trials your trials must be independent one can't affect the other so drawing cards without replacement would not be binomial even if you were looking to see if you got a king or not your probability if you don't put the card back the probability of the next card changes so they would not be independent X, which is what you're going to be counting, is going to represent the number 
have successes and the probability and this goes on with the independent part the probability of success remains constant so those are the five things that it takes for a, for a random variable to be binomial so if we're looking at a given situation here's an example a rubber surgery has a 90 percent success rate the surgery is performed on three patients we're going to create a tree diagram that talks about the success rate or the possible outcomes for these surgeries so the first surgery could either be a success or a failure the second surgery would either be a success or a failure and the third surgery would either be a success or a failure so I'm just creating a tree diagram so you can visibly see what all your outcomes would be so the outcome here if I follow the top row of the tree would be success 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 that would be your three surgeries the next one would be success success failure then success failure success success failure 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 success success failure success failure 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 success or failure 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 going back to the fundamental counting principle there are two ways that each surgery can can happen or the outcome of each surgery so there should be eight possible outcomes if we have three surgeries so one two three four five six seven eight when we look at the number of successes here I have three successes two two one two one one zero if you remember back to the cards and how we calculated probability since each success has a 90 percent success rate for three successes that would be 0 0.9 times 0 0.9 times 0.1 excuse me times 0.9 or I could write 0 0.9 cubed two successes is going to be 0 0.9 squared times 0 0.1 two successes 0.9 squared times 0.1 one success 0.9 times 0.1 squared because that means there's two failures excuse me yeah two successes 0.9 squared times 0.1 one success 0.1 squared times excuse me I'll write it the same way sorry about that guys so this would be 0.9 times 0.1 squared another one success 0.9 times 0.1 squared and then 0 would be 0.1 cubed so for 0.9 cubed I guess actual power helps here so 0.9 raised to the third power is 0 0.729 0 0.9 squared times 0 0.1 is 0 0.081 so that would be 0 0.081 that would be 0 0.081 this one would be 0 0.081 Then 0 0.9 times 0 0.1 squared is 0 0.009. 0 0.009. 0 0 0.009. 
and then 0.1 cubed is 0 0.001. So from that, I can actually make a probability distribution. My possible outcomes are zero successes, one success, two successes, three successes. The probability of zero successes is 0 .001. One success happens three times. So 0 0.009 plus 0 0.009 plus 0 0.009, which is 0 0.027. Two successes, that's the 0 0.081, and that happens three different ways. So that would be 0 0.243. And then 0 0.729. Make sure that adds up to one to make sure it's valid. So 0 0.001 plus 0 0.027 plus 0.243 plus 0.729. And I just put the wrong number in. 729. And the sum is 1. So I know all these are between 0 and 1 and my probability Sum is 1, so that shows that this binomial distribution, it had two possible outcomes. The surgery was either a success or it wasn't. We were counting the number of successes. The probability distribution it's itself adds up to 1. We had an n number of trials, which was 3. So n was 3. x equals the number of successful surgeries. You would hope whether one surgery was successful has no impact on whether the next surgery was successful since they would be different people so that shows you they're independent. The probability of success stayed constant and we were counting the number of successes. So we have a probability distribution that is binomial and then that binomial distribution is discrete in nature. So if we go back here this was point zero zero one. I know this one was point two four three point seven two nine and this one was 0 0.027. Are any of the events unusual? Yes. Both of these are less than 0 0.05. 0 and 1 successful surgeries. explain why this is binomial. So I kind of said that before, but I'll go back through it. So you have two outcomes, success and failure. And I can't spell failure. You have three trials. Successful surgeries are independent of each other. The probability of success is the stays the same. And X is the number of successful surgeries. So that kind of gives you a definite understanding of why this is binomial and that it is a valid binomial distribution. Looking at example two, 
based on what I've said, I'm actually going to let you go back. These answers will be posted, but I want to let you go back and look at why this would not be binomial. Um, red marble, so you do have only two outcomes. You draw a marble, it's either red or it's not. But it doesn't, you are going to draw three marbles. But the fact that it's without replacement means your probability of success does not stay the same. Now, I'm sure you're asking yourself, is there an easy way to do this on the calculator? And there is. I'm going to show you, and then I'm going to write it down, where you can go on the calculator to calculate binomial distribution. So this is going to be calculating binomial probability because it wouldn't make sense for you to list all the outcomes of every possible situation. If you had 15 trials of something and you tried to do um, a tree diagram and list them all out and calculate them, that just wouldn't make any sense. So we've got to come up with a way, and your calculator does have a way to be able to calculate binomial probabilities. There are distributions in this calculator and they are found under second vars. So you're going to go to second vars. You will scroll down and you will see PDF functions. And this is going to hold true for everything in section 4.3 as well. That's why I'm just writing PDF. And then I'll show you what you'll use for section 4.2, which is binomial, and then 4.3, which is geometric and Poisson. PDF is going to be used when calculating probability at a point. or the probability that x is equal to a number. Then you're going to see a function called CDF. This is going to be used to calculate cumulative probability. So in other words, the probability when x is less than some number or the probability when x is less than or equal to some number because the cumulative probability starts at zero and adds probabilities up to a stopping point. Now, unless you have a new calculator, anytime you want to calculate greater than or greater than or equal to, since cumulative always starts at zero and adds up, you're going to have to put into your calculator, and I'll show this to you in an example. you're going to have to do 1 minus the CDF function. So this is used to calculate what is left on what is left over. Because it will Add up the probabilities that you don't want, and when you subtract those from 1, you'll get what's left over, which is what you want left. So looking at your calculator, if you scroll down, and you have to scroll down a lot, you will see down here at A and B, you have binome PDF and binome CDF. Now, this is a newer calculator. This is not a newer calculator, and so whenever I hit... Um, 
mine, it will tell me what is your end, what's your probability of success, what number are you stopping at. You'll see when I do a problem, if you have an older calculator and this doesn't come up, how you actually have to input things in the calculator. So let's go back to our example. And we are talking about, in number three, a survey indicates that 41% of women in the U.S. consider reading their favorite leisure time activity, reading to be their favorite leisure time activity. You randomly select four U.S. women and ask them if reading is their, and that should say favorite, leisure time activity. Is this an example of a binomial experiment? So, what are we doing here? We have two outcomes. They are that it is their favorite or not. We have an N number of trials because N is 4. We have a probability of success. Your probability is 0.41. You have, you're counting the number of successes. Excuse me, you're counting the number of successes. And whether one person thinks that reading is their favorite or not is independent of the others. So those are your five things that tell you that it is binomial. All right, now we're going to look at example four. 45% of adults say they have cheated on a test or exam before. You randomly select 12 adults, so there's your n. n is 12. Again, this is a different problem. Find the probability. You know that p is equal to 0.45. So let me go back up here. This is just p, not p of x. Find the probability the number of adults who say that they have cheated on a test or exam before is, so we're counting the number. Exactly five. So what I'm going to ask that you do is write a probability statement. Because if you write the probability statement, then you can discern which one of these functions that you should use. I'll say, is it a PDF, a CDF, or a 1 minus CDF? So exactly five is looking at the probability that x is equal to five. Exactly two, that would be the probability x is equal to two. At most, 6, so that's the probability x is less than or equal to 6. More than 4, that's the probability x is greater than 4. And at least 1 would be the probability x is greater than or equal to 1. Now, we're going to use the binomial PDF or CDF functions in the calculator. N is the number of trials. P is the probability of success. And X is the number you stop calculating the probability for. I'm going to tell you, because I'm going to show you an easy way to do this, if you'll write it out, it'll make a whole lot more sense, that x is going to be the number to the left of the bracket. So, let me show you what I mean. When we're doing PDF, we're just going to use binom PDF. And if your calculator doesn't ask for these things, then this is what you would put in the calculator in the order. N, which is 12. P, which is 0.45. And then X, which is 5. So then part B would be binomial PDF, because that's again an equal to problem. 12.45 and 2. At most 6, that's less than or equal to, 
So less than or less than or equal to, I'm going to use the CDF function. So I'm going to use binome CDF 12.45. The number I'm going to stop at, 4, 5, 6, 7, dot, dot, dot. Less than or equal to 6 is those numbers. So 6 is my number to the left of the bracket. So 6 is going to be the number I put in the calculator for x. If I had just said less than 6, my bracket would have been here, and this number would have been 5. Greater than 4. Well, greater than 4 means I want these numbers left. Remember that I said greater than and greater than or equal to, you would have to do 1 minus binom CDF. And remember I said this was what you were going to get rid of. So 12 trials, probability of success is 0.45. I am getting rid of the number to the left of the bracket is 4. So I'm going to add up the probabilities up to 4, but then I'm going to subtract them from 1 total and that will give me what's left, which will be 5 and above. At least 1, that's greater than or equal to. So I would do 1 minus binom CDF, 12.45, 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. At least 1 means I want to get rid of everything below 1, so I'm going to stop at 0. So what that looks like on your calculator, second vars, so second vars, you can scroll up or down, up will actually get you there faster. I choose PDF, So n is 12, p is 0.45, my x value is 5. And when you hit paste, if you have a newer calculator, it pastes it to look like exactly what I wrote out. It will be very helpful to you, especially if you are turning in stuff on your lab for me, for you to write the probability statement, for you to write out the calculator steps that you would use, because I can give you partial credit. If you put a, you know, a number here that was one off, then I can tell where you made your mistake and give you partial credit. Otherwise, if you just give me an answer, I don't know if you used PDF instead of CDF. I don't know what you used. So for that problem, the answer, and I usually go four decimal places when I talk about probability. So point two 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 five. Do it again for the 2, PDF, this time X is 2, enter, 0 0.0339. For CDF, second VARS, binome CDF, N is 12, P is 0.45. The number I'm going to stop at is 6 because I want it included. And I get 0.7393. For the next one, remember, I have to do 1 minus before I do the function. Or I calculate it and then subtract from 1. But 1 minus will do it. 1 minus binom CDF, 12.45. 4, and I get point, whoops, 6956, and then 1 minus binom CDF, 12.450, 0, Point nine 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 two. 
So that shows you how to use the calculator whenever you're trying to solve probabilities for a binomial problem without having to create a probability distribution table and then go from there. The other thing that I want to show you for binomial that you could be asked to do is to do expected value or mean. And that is equal to n times p. Standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q, where q is the probability of failure, so q is 1 minus p. So those are other things that you could be asked in section 4.2. So here, the number of adults expected to have cheated, that would be 12 times 0.45. and that's 5.4 or approximately 5 people. So, the last section that I want to talk about is section 4.3 which are other discrete random variable distributions, namely geometric distribution and the Poisson distribution. Geometric is a lot like binomial. It has two possible outcomes. success and failure. It does not have an N. X is going to be when you get the first success. So the first success is what's key to geometric. You still have independent trials, your probability still remains constant. So if we look at this problem, geometric football, uh, um, the football player Tom Brady completes a pass 63.7% of the time. Find the probability that the first pass he completes is the second pass. So that's the probability that X happens on number two. Just like with binomial, under second vars, if you scroll to the very bottom or scroll up, you'll see that Geomet has a PDF and a CDF. So all the same rules apply, which is why when I gave you these notes, I did not put binome or anything in front of this because the same concept applies regardless of whether it's binomial or geometric. So this would be Geomet. PDF. You do have an N. So your P is 0.637. Notice I'm writing all these percentages as decimals. And your X is 2. The first pass he completes is the third pass. So that would be probability X is equal to 3. The first pass he completes is the first or the second. So he's going to complete his first pass on or before his second pass. If he does not complete his first two passes, then he's going to complete the first pass after his second. So this would be a geomet. It looks like an F. Geomet PDF, going back to B, 0.6373. Less than or equal to is a CDF, Geomet CDF, 0.637. The number I'm stopping at, 0, 1, 2, 3, 
all are before 2. 2 is to the left of the bracket, so the number I'm stopping at is 2. Then this is greater than, so that's 1 minus geomet CDF. If I want to be after 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, after 2 happens here. 2 is the number to the left of my bracket, so 0.6372. This whole bracket thing is nothing that you will find in any book or on any video. This is just something that I have been able to show my students and they understand it really well. And then once you find these probabilities, you can answer whether they're in, any of them are unusual. The last type of distribution is the Poisson distribution. The Poisson, Poisson distribution, the main feature is that you're going to be given the mean. So the mean amount of what should happen is given to you and then you're looking at the probability of different things happening. So if we go back to our problems, a major hurricane is a hurricane with wind speeds of 111 miles per hour or greater. During the 20th century, the mean number of major hurricanes to strike the U.S. mainland per year was about 0.6. So instead of a probability, you have a mean. Find the probability of the number of hurricanes. So the concept stays the same. Exactly 1 would be the probability x equals 1. That would be Poisson PDF. The mean is 0.6 and x is 1. At most, 1. So that means x is less than or equal to 1. That would be Poisson CDF 0 0.6, 0, 1, 2, 3. At most, 1. 1 is the number to the left of the bracket. That's the one you stop at. More than 1. Greater than 1. Make these look like 1's, or try to anyway. So that would be 1 minus Poisson CDF. 0.6. More than 1. The number to the left of the bracket is still the 1. Exactly 3 in any 2 year time period. We're not going to, we're going to omit that problem. Because that was 0.6 per year. And then you can look at those to see if there are any that were um, unusual. So that gives you the rundown of Chapter 4. And you will find those problems already assigned to you in my stat lab. Within the next couple of days, I'll be putting up another video for Chapter 5 for instructions. And I'll also be adding the Chapter 5 lab. Have a great weekend.